Municipal governments are comprised of local elected officials and encompass a range of administrative bodies, including, but not limited to, cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. This is the Political Trenches Local Government at Work, the show dedicated to talking about the most pressing issues confronting municipal governments throughout Canada. I, along with Ian McCormick, will provide insights and perspectives on the challenges and opportunities that confront local governments as they strive to serve their communities. We are continuing our journey through the municipal alphabet today, and today we are bringing you the letter S, which stands for Shared Goals. Later in the episode, Ian and I will be joined by the Executive Director of the Red Deer River Municipal Users Group. But first, we will head to Ontario to talk about a mayor who is facing legal action over her ex election expenses. Then we will chat about four municipalities who have rejected strong mayor powers. Afterwards, we will discuss a council voting to elect a council member from a list of residents who have applied for the council position. And finally, we will end in Alberta, where one community submitted a petition to introduce a crosswalk and flagpole bylaw. But first, Ian, we are back and with a full episode. But always, how are you? Good. Since we last talked, Chris, I've spent a couple of weeks in Atlantic Canada, one in Newfoundland, one in New Brunswick, uh, just kind of getting some of our, getting our offices up there started, meeting with clients, attending conferences, and eating the occasional lobster roll and quite a lot of fish and chips. I really enjoyed it. So by the sounds of it, you 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 understand the difference between St. John's and St. John. <laughs> I do, as a matter of fact. Why? Do for, you understand those, the difference? For those who are listening to this, no, I do not. And I was flying out to the Newfoundland uh, Labrador Municipalities Conference, and I ended up in New Brunswick because I thought St. John and St. John's were the same thing. Guess they are not. <laughs> The mayor of Haldeman County facing a possible end to her freshman term in office claims that any inaccuracies in her election finances were due to inexperience as a rookie grassroots candidate. On October 4th, an auditor found Shelley Ann Bentley broke election spending rules in 2022, including not filing a required audit of her expenses and for accepting thousands of dollars in ineligible cash donations. While no date has been set, the mayor is set to stand before a judge for failing to submit an audit on her campaign finances. Ian, while there is no rule to remove a mayor from office due to improper election expenses, how can the county move forward with issues facing the community with a matter like this hanging over the mayor's head? Certainly it's difficult. Uh, this frustrates me to no end, Chris, that... The, there's a saying that I've heard many, many times about ignorance is no excuse when it comes to the law. Grassroots candidate or experienced candidate, I really don't care. There is uh, there's one set of rules that everybody has to abide by, whether you're a freshman person like this pun or whether you've run in the last six elections. Things like eligibility to stand for office, the expenses that were he noted here, campaigning practices, signs, all those sorts of things are contained certainly in provincial legislation and almost always are provided through municipal associations in provinces and territories, and often on municipal websites, either through information for candidates or through candidate orientations or pages on web on municipal websites that have all that information. But so uh, this frustrates me. I mean, she she was suggesting that her errors were errors of omission, maybe in good conscience, or not certainly not because of some sort of Machiavellian desire to circumvent the rules. I don't buy it that uh, she could have had advisors. She certainly could have had people who are reading, who were reading legislation and policy and bylaw and all sorts of things, but didn't do it. And so uh, that's tough. As for now, this now makes it difficult for the municipality as well, because they have a, a leader who certainly has been accused anyway of breaking the rules before day one even started. And I think that that really casts a pall over council and its authority and any desires of what it wants to do in its first year or two years or whatever in office. I'm frustrated by this sort of thing. You bring up a good point. And I, I'm frustrated as well because I've ran for municipal government in Ontario. And when you pick up that candidate nomination form, it clearly states if you read it, and, I, and I'm going to clarify that, if you read it, you have to submit an audited report of what is allowed or for of your finances. And in that report, it does outline what you can accept as in-kind donations and as in uh, donations financially. 
I don't know the mayor of uh, Haldeman County. I've never had her on my show. I've reached out to have her on their show. I just haven't heard anything back from her. But I can tell you that this do it doesn't pass the smell test to me. Something seems a little bit fishy here, and I'm not sure what's going on. When it comes to the governance side of it, and I think this is where my question comes into play here, is with a mayor going in front of a court... Does she not have to recuse herself of potential issues that are going to be in front of council? Because we talk about legal, land, and uh, personnel. Legal and land are in front of the courts as well. When you're going through a trial yourself, should you not be uh, present or sitting at a council meeting? I, well, my without knowing the ins and outs of the legislation, the judicial process there, I can't really comment. However... She However, is, on the show, we have to comment. Yeah, exactly, right? Where's the fun <laughs> if we don't? She is innocent until proven guilty. So unless she's in a conflict of interest, say, or uh, what, what not within her own counsel, and she ought to be recusing herself anyway into the normal course of events, fine. Uh, that ought to happen. If they are, if counsel is dealing with things in a closed session or in camera, she is still, as a duly elected official, until the judiciary decides otherwise, part of that counsel. So... There are certainly times where the smell test, to your words, doesn't get passed. This might be one of them. I've run into them in other cases where in a nomination process that somebody gets nominated to run for council, uh, stand, stand for office, maybe gets elected, but, and has always passed that bar, but maybe has already like pre-disqualified themselves by the nature of whatever they've done in days, years prior to actually getting their hand, their signatures on that nomination form. So there are lots of little loopholes or ways around the system, which hopefully eventually come and catch people who ought not to be doing what they ought not to be doing. And do we really want people like this who are willing to flout the rules serving the public on council representing themselves? Four Ontario municipalities have turned down the province's offer of strong mayor powers because of concerns either with housing targets the government has tied to them or worries that the powers would lend themselves to dictatorships. And I'm quoting that. The Ford government has assigned housing targets to 50 municipalities in the province of Ontario. Their portion of the 1.5 million homes that Premier Doug Ford has promised to get built by 2020. 2031. Ontario is currently well behind the pace needed to accomplish that goal, though. As long as municipalities formally commit to their targets through a housing pledge, the province will grant them strong mayor powers. Four municipalities, as I said, Newmarket, New Tuxemeth, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong, North Fork County, and this is why I said this is goes into what I was talking about the last story, Haldeman County have all given a straight up no thanks to the power. Ian, we are seeing the use of strong mayor powers in Ontario increase at a rapid pace. Every day I'm seeing stories across Ontario about strong mayor powers being used. Mm -hmm. uh, some councillors have come out and said they are against them, and some council mayors are coming out and saying they're for them. Are we seeing a divide in the province of Ontario regarding strong mayor powers? I hadn't actually considered it as a divide, Chris, but perhaps, perhaps we are. I mean, they're the largest municipalities, so we're not seeing it in the small towns and small villages, but we are seeing it in the larger places with higher populations, typically more centralized with higher requirements for housing. I also think this is a little bit of downloading, too, that this is something the province has tied some strings to. It's like if you want the lollipop, you're still going to have to pay for it at the end of the day. So those municipalities that are saying we don't want strong mayor powers seem to be doing so for a couple of reasons. One is they don't want strong mayor powers. Uh, they think that the authority vested in the mayor as a member of council and first among equals is appropriate. Others have said, uh, I, to my knowledge anyway, we don't think we can hit that housing target. So we can't accept the strong mayor powers. And I think at least one of them has said, can we revise the housing target? And then we'll take the strong mayor powers as well. So you can't have it all ways. I certainly am not an elected official, but if I was a mayor of one of these municipalities, I'd have a really tough time justifying taking on uh, strong mayor powers and using them to my benefit or to the community's benefit as I see it and put really striking a divide between uh, members of council and the chief elected official. Further to, to your comment too, though, it does certainly start to, to to present a divide between strong mayors and weak mayors. Of course, those are in brackets. They're not people who are strong and people who are weak, whether it's physical or 
any other type of strength. But so I, I this again, this is a, a list of stories today, Chris, that seems to be uh, raising my dander a little bit. Um, so I, I had the pleasure to sit down with Norfolk County Mayor Amy Martin for the cross border air interviews, which is actually airing Thursday morning, a day after this comes out. And in one of our conversations, I did ask her about the strong mayor powers and why the municipality rejected them. So uh, what the story doesn't say here, and this is where I want to sort of do a little bit of a clarification, is council voted to not give strong okay. mayor powers to municipalities. Some councils have been presented in a, a motion in front of them to say, will we accept the housing targets that the province has put forward? Uh, in Norfolk County, uh, the, the, the mayor put forward a motion and council rejected them because they thought not, we, we agree with you. We think that it, it, potentially you won't abuse them. But what about the next mayor? What about the mayor after that? Just mm -hmm. because you're not going to abuse them doesn't mean four years down the line or eight years down the line, someone else is going to abuse them. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I found interesting in my conversation with Amy Martin, the mayor, was they've tied strong mayor powers to housing or uh, the Building Faster Accelerator Fund, which basically gives if you sign the pledge, we're going to give you money and we're going to give you money to sort of help build housing in your community. And. I can imagine that probably scares a lot of municipalities into signing the pledge, which gives them the strong mayor powers. And now they're left with these strong mayor powers, which they can vote for budgets by themselves. They can fire the CEO at will. They can appoint directors at will. This this kind of put, has put municipalities into a odd position, if you ask me. It's insidious. I, I'm not sure, uh, Chris, if that was a question or just a statement. It was but, both. <laughs> it was both. So, I, yes, I agree with you. There's the short response to your statement. Votters Ontario held a special council meeting this past Monday to determine who will be appointed to its vacant council seat. Goderich Town Council has been missing one member since the passing of former Mayor Miles Murdoch in August. The mayor and deputy mayor's seats were both filled by appointments, and now council will have 11 applicants to choose from, from its special November 20th meeting. All applicants had the chance to speak and answer questions before a vote was held on Monday. Now, we should note that while we are recording this episode prior to the news of which candidate was elected, we will have more information probably later on. We just want to uh, talk about the political impacts of this story. And I've got to ask, Ian... How democratic is the process where voters don't get to choose their elected official, but members of their own council will? I, well, I don't think it's democratic per se in that it is not representative of the people who elected them because they are people who have applied kind of like a committee or a board rather than an elected council. So it's it's a peculiarity that is not unique to this circumstance. There are other um, jurisdictions in Canada that follow a similar model. But it's not common. Other places in Canada will go to a by-election, which is fairly common. Although if it's close to an election, a general election, sometimes the by-election doesn't happen either. So I, I, I recently sat down with Rose Sicolia from uh, Brantford, Ontario, and she was actually selected from a list of 20 candidates in 2018 to fill a vacancy. And she said it felt weird for her to be elected in that manner because she didn't really feel like she was being elected, but she was still elected in the sense that people selected her and elected her out of the body of council. Um for council members who I've chatted with, and I, I should be up front, I actually know my aunt, the former mayor of Scugog, Ontario, when she was running for regional council, there was a death on council, and she was appointed this way. She was on council, she ran against a fellow councillor, and the council members voted for the two councillors who they thought should fill that vacancy. I just find it fascinating that in 2023, when we're all about open democracy, we are still having sort of people elect it in this manner yeah i yeah i completely agree and it i mean it's a, probably a legacy as you have suggested again to times in times past and it's similar to how we deal with tie votes as well which is not necessarily associated with democracy but certainly is an arc uh, archaic uh, way of doing of picking a, a person to serve on the seat so i guess it's probably the 
best alternative next to actually physically electing someone. And they do only fill out the term. It's not like they get a full term on a council council spot for this. And much like other jurisdictions, if you're if you're close to a general election, this probably wouldn't happen then either. A petition has been submitted to the town of Westlock, and councillors will either have to pass a proposed crosswalk and flagpole bylaw or hold a plebiscite to allow residents to decide on its fate. In the November 7th edition of the Town and Country this week, the newspaper reported that the municipality had verified the authenticity of a neutrality petition calling for a crosswalks and flag bylaw. Under this bylaw, the town will only be allowed to fly its own flag or that of a province of Alberta slash Canadian flag on public property or at town facilities. As well, the bylaw will only allow crosswalks to be painted with the traditional white lantern design. The catalyst for this bylaw and the petition was the town's decision earlier this year to paint a crosswalk with the colors of the Progress Pride flag back in June, based on the request from a gay-straight alliance. Ian, while it's not unusual for a petition to be presented to council, how does a council navigate an issue like this to ensure a resolution that will please the majority of residents? I like the way you put the majority in there at the end of it, because it's certainly not going to please all of them. So first of all, under the Alberta's Municipal Government Act, there are certain requirements for petitions to be deemed sufficient. They have to have at least a certain proportion of people sign them. They have to be witnessed. They have to have addresses, all the rest of that, a whole bunch of things that have to be done. So if the petitioning group can get that uh, get that to happen, they can submit the petition to uh, council CAO. CAO will go through it, try and, and then determine whether it is sufficient or not, and make a report to that effect to council, at which point council has to act on it. So what we see here, however, is a sufficient petition on a topic I think you and I had talked about months ago uh, in terms of the town of Westlock. It's just difficult, I think, because what we're getting, what we're seeing here is a return to direct democracy rather than representative democracy. And that's a bit of a slippery slope, particularly in the age of right wing populism, well, populism in general, which usually seems to be right wing, where we see people who are who are self-interested rather than uh, interested in the community at large, interested in short term rather than long term. It's one of those cases sometimes where councils will make a decision for the long-term benefit of the community where there's still some short-term pain involved. And knowing that councils typically have more information than the average citizen does before they make a call like this. It's a, it's a slippery slope, Chris. It's going to be a story that we'll, I'll, I'll be watching for sure. And we might yeah. be discussing a little bit later in 2024 as this continues on, but we'll be right back after a quick break with our interview with the executive director of the Red Deer River Municipal Users Group. Welcome to S is for Shared Goals on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Rudy Friesen, Executive Director of the Red Deer River Municipal Users Group, the driving force behind a collective effort that brings together rural and urban municipalities within the Red Deer River Basin. Now, with what makes this group tick? The Red Deer River Municipal Users Group is not your ordinary association. It is a dynamic coalition of municipalities, a nexus of elected officials who have come together to address the pressing issues facing their communities. But it's more than just a meeting of minds. It's a commitment to shared goals, a dedication to long-term sustainability. The Red Deer Municipal Users Group stands as a testament to the power of collaboration, showcasing how by focusing solely on municipalities and representing a local elected officials, they can cut through the noise and concentrate on what truly matters, the well-being of their communities. Now, the mandate of the organization takes a forward-looking stance. Ensure the reliable quality water supplies are available for a sustainable and growing economy in each of the members' municipalities. So it's not just about today, it's about laying the groundwork for the prosperity of the future generations. So with that, Rudy, welcome to the Political Trenches. Oh, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here, Chris. I uh, will value the opportunity. I do want to just take a moment and say, Rudy, you did want to do a quick little preamble just to make sure that you acknowledge the people that you are representing, but also in your day-to-day -day work as well. 
Absolutely. Uh, just to, to clarify, uh, because there may be some that uh, that know me as the CAO of the, for the town of Bowdoin. That is correct. I am full time the chief administrative officer for the town of Bowdoin. Um, I've had the opportunity for the last two years uh, to serve in this administrative role with the Red Deer River Municipal Users Group. So um, uh, I, I sometimes refer to it as a side of my desk project. Um, <laughs> you know, it takes up a few hours a, a week for me. Uh, but uh, it's been a fantastic organization to be a part of and and the the collective work that we do and the uh, and the common goal of the the member municipalities of which there's approximately I think 34 uh, is really an inspiring piece of work and and uh, although it is a, a not a full-time workload it's a full-time passion for me to talk about water and all things water and and I guess that's why we're here today so in my introduction I gave out the sort of the mandate of the group a little bit background on the group but before we get into the meat and potatoes of the interview, in your own words, can you explain what the Red Deer River Municipal User Group is? So um, I, I think in order to explain what it is, I'll, I'll maybe start with a, just a, a brief comment about where it started. Um, and so uh, there was a lot of significant development and a lot of significant talk about development in the mid 2000s in the province of Alberta. Um, there was a lot of expectation that there was gonna be dynamic and unprecedented growth uh, throughout the province. And many municipalities were aligning themselves and preparing for that type of growth. And somewhere along the line, uh, when you talk about growth, uh, whether it's in uh, uh, municipal population, uh, rural economic development, agriculture, uh, manufacturing, anything like that, the conversation kept coming back to water. Where do we get the water from? And uh, it was about that same time that the water licensing provisions for the southern por portion of the South Saskatchewan River Basin, the bow, the old man, um, uh, those watersheds were licensed out. And quickly, eyes were turning northward to the northernmost uh, basin in the South Saskatchewan River Basin, that being the Red Deer. And so a group of like-minded municipalities aligned themselves to say that uh, as a group of municipalities, we need to advocate for the health of the river basin, not just for today, but for future growth and development and how this licensing is gonna play itself out in the province, how growth is going to be uh, prescribed and, and what kind of changes are gonna happen. And, and this group of municipalities said that throughout this, we wanna be able to advocate, as you said, not just for today, but the long-term sustainability and health of the watershed. So that's how we came together. Uh, so that's been, you know, almost 20 years now. And uh, uh, we can we continue to pursue that advocacy and, and to support projects uh, that support our mandate. So you, were you said there were somewhere around 38 members, yeah. a lot. And amongst those members, when I was looking through the list, you've got cities, you've got municipal districts, you got towns, you got villages and special areas as well. I can't imagine that they all have the same perspective on things. Uh, how do you actually manage that? Is there a hierarchy of members or do they have conflicting opinions and desires? So um, for the most part, uh, while at first glance, you'd say that there would be that diversity of thought, uh, it's quite like-minded uh, uh, in its broader goal and its higher level uh, conversations. Uh, we do at times when we get into specific conversations about specific projects that we want to advocate for, uh, we will require that that uh, members will go back to their municipal councils and discuss this to say, how does this affect us on an individual local basis? But for the most part, the consensus building is very seamless. Uh, uh, there's a common thread about water and, and, and there's an understanding that whatever you use it for, we all want it to make sure it's there. Okay. So today's uh, municipal alphabet is S is for shared services, sorry, for shared goals, and it might as well be shared services as well. Yeah. Is there a shared vision of success for uh, the user group? And if you, if there is, how do you just, just how did you arrive at it? So there, there's absolutely a shared vision for the uh, utilization and the future prosperity of the watershed. Um, and, and it's, it's one that was arrived at uh, started, first of all, with some rules and leg legislation that are already in place. Um, uh, first in time, first in right is a phrase that's often used with water licensing throughout the watershed. Um, on a less formal basis, uh, you know, if there's ever shortages, uh, you know, you talk about 
uh, residents first, people first, uh, uh, before all others. Uh, so there's those common uh, commonalities that that uh, link us together uh, through previously decided legislation. But as we move forward, uh, we're able to find a lot of common ground, um, probably in in so far as that everything that we really talk about from whether it's from Clearwater County or, or whether it's all the way to the Saskatchewan border, uh, we're talking about rural economic development. And how do we best define that? And each member defines it a little bit differently, but we can all agree that we're talking about rural economic development. We're talking about pr prosperity throughout the watershed uh, and and the health of the uh, of the watershed itself. So that's where the common ground really lies for us. Thanks. I just want to jump in here for a second because I want to talk about the membership for a second. Um, you expand a very vast uh, portion of Alberta from the Saskatchewan border almost to the British Columbia border. Yeah. Um, shared goals are great. Shared visions are great. But the issues affecting Starland County Special Areas Board, which saw a massive drought this year, which probably had to take from the uh, basin a lot more, say, than Red Deer or even Clearwater County. Yeah. How do you balance the shared goals with the understanding that every unique community along the basin, along the Red Deer River, has their own unique challenges? Because I think that's the big crux of having a shared goal and having shared understanding is two different things. Yeah, it, you're absolutely right. And and it, it provides a dynamic to the conversation. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you don't say, Rudy. <laughs> how's that for a politically direct way of saying it? Um, but, uh, but it also uh, comes with a lot of attached realities. Uh, some of those realities are, um, for in fact, uh, apportionment is the reality for us. We are legally bound as a province to release 50% of our river waters to Saskatchewan. Okay, we, we know that's going to happen. Uh, within that, uh, we know that to, uh, in order to provide uh, the city of Red Deer with the water that they need for their growth and prosperity, they need to have a minimum of 16 cubic meters per second flowing past the city of Red Deer every day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Those are those are givens. Now, within that, you're absolutely right. Everybody has a little bit different dynamic and everybody has a different um, uh, current issue that they're dealing with. With special areas, it's absolutely right now about drought. And our group from the Clearwater County all the way down to special areas uh, and the MD of Acadia are extremely supportive of the work that's being done on that Eastern Irrigation Project right now because we know that it's going to be a dynamic impact for that region, but also ultimately for the province and, and a benefit to all the users on the watershed. Um, we also know that there's some realities in terms of that flow of water. And uh, one of our members has often said that, you know, we can talk about this all we want, but unless you're storing water and managing it, you're just a spectator. We can talk about it all we want. And as long as we talk about it, the water continues to flow past us and off into the province of Saskatchewan and through to uh, Hudson Bay. So that becomes a big part of our commonality too, is that um, it, it's one river flowing at the speed that it chooses and we have to manage it to the best of our abilities, knowing that we want to keep it around for all the time. I'd like to uh, get back, if I can, to some of the structural pieces around this, too. And you were set up as a voluntary organization that sounds like that partners could come together if they wanted to, but didn't necessarily have to. What do you see as either the advantages or maybe the disadvantages of sharing this service, these types of service, this type of a service, uh, this type of user group, the goals that you've got, the vision that you share? What are, what's good, the good and the bad about it? So, so the good and the good and the bad. Uh, the the easy answer on the good side is the collective voice, and so um, when you've got such a diversity of membership uh, speaking with a common goal. Um, uh, People, people take notice. And, and so uh, when we talk about uh, the role of each member and, and the benefit that they get from membership, uh, there's no question that when we talk to the city of Red, Red Deer, I mean, they're, they're the big ones on the block and it's important for us to have them participate in and support the goals and objectives of the, of the uh, user group. Um, but they also recognize that 
um, you know, when you take a longer vision and a, and a broader vision of the watershed, uh, what's good for everybody is also good for them. Uh, so that there's that collective that really works uh, uh, in our favor. Um, I, I think probably the, the negative of it, um, as we get more and more involved in different projects, I would say is something that I referred to a little bit earlier. While we see that we're a very diverse group because geographically we're a diverse group, uh, there is there is the risk that there's a perception that we're a very linear group because it's just all municipalities, right? Okay. So, you know, from the outside looking in, it's like, well, that's really one voice when we feel like it's a whole bunch of voices singing in unison. Hmm. How do you uh, how do you deal with next year and the year beyond and the year beyond? Do you have any sort of strategy in place or annual priorities that you look at as a group? Uh, we we do, um, um, and and I'll start by saying uh, our organization, just like every other organization, was impacted by the COVID <laughs> COVID curveball, uh, and and it uh, with that slowdown, it took us a little bit of a ramp up. Um, we've, we've got a long-term strategic plan in terms of some key elements that we try to focus on moving forward uh, that are important, we believe, uh, to the long-term viability of the watershed. And I'll, I'll give you a, a couple of uh, key examples. Uh, in 2023, um, we've been working uh, closely and, and financially supporting uh, the work of WaterSmart Canada to reevaluate and update uh, and bring, in, uh, bring into force a brand new South Saskatchewan River operating model that uh, allows you to take different impacts on the South Saskatchewan River watershed, like drought and flood and snowpack and glacial melt and rainfall, and plug them into this model and see how it impacts the entire watershed and individual sub-basins like the Red Deer in that. So that's that's work that we're investing in today and, and, and supporting today that will have long-term impacts on how we how we create what we can for predictability in the river system. Uh, one of the things that we're, we're also uh, discussing uh, in our long-term plans is, uh, and I said with reference to the Red Deer watershed, um, you know, we've got one facility on the watershed, uh, Glenifer Reservoir and Dixon Dam. So, you know, we're having conversations about what it would look like and where it would be and, and what would have to happen for there to be an, another additional storage facility on the Red Deer River. That's a 25 year conversation. So uh, so we're definitely uh, looking to the future and, and looking to protect the watershed and the, the communities that are on it. So there's it's definitely a long term vision of the group. Well, it's all, it's always something political on the political trenches, local government at work. But Rudy, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to sit down with us and just even scratch the surface because in this half hour conversation, I feel like we didn't really get to all the things we wanted to get to, but I appreciate you taking a half hour, hour out of your day to talk about the Red Deer River Municipal Users Group or RDR Mug. Pleasure to do so. Looking forward to more time in the future. Thanks, Rudy. Our full interview with Rudy will be airing next Wednesday. We'll be right back after this quick message. Ian, uh, we are back and it seems like we've got our groove back on. I know we did have a month off, but we had an amazing S is for shared goals. Great interview <laughs> with Rudy there. How'd you think the episode went? I enjoyed talking about the Red Deer River and its user municipal user group and we had no end of stories, and I think one of the uh, the advantages, if you like, about having a, a month off is that we were able to distill some of our typical stories down into, well, we ended up with four that uh, were pretty punchy this time, and so I enjoyed that for sure. Before I let you go, I do have to ask you, because we, sure. we, we, we've been push, uh, pushing back and forth on this uh, a little bit, but I want to get your comments. Uh, we're seeing what's happening in Chestermere, Alberta right now, and this is uh, getting more and more uh, newsworthy as things go on. We are seeing the Minis Minister of Municipal Affairs coming in saying, we will fire the entire council. The council saying, mm, we're going to sue you so that way we can stop you from firing us. Have you seen some something similar to this ever in your time in municipal government? No, I, I haven't. I mean, I've seen something similar maybe in school boards, but I've never seen it to this extent in a municipality, particularly a city as sophisticated as Chestermere is. No, it's uh, it's it's curiouser and curiouser. 
We'll be watching that story as it unfolds for sure over the next few months. Uh, but as always, we will be back in two weeks' time. And I don't think we've ever been able to do this on the show, but we're going to do it now. We will be back in two weeks' time with T is for triage. And we have a great guest going to be lined up for that. So please tune in. Ian, it's always a pleasure to sit down with you in the political trenches and talk about some of the most fascinating stories across Canada. It is fun. And I'm really glad we do get to talk about stories right across the country. So thanks very much, Chris. Talk to you later.